So welcome everybody. Uh, it's already the seventh virtual seminar in this weekly seminar series. Today we have two treats, magic numbers in protein phase, trans protein phase separation from Nedwin Green from Princeton and constitutive splicing and economics of scale in gene expression from Pangwan Ding from Caltech. Um, you guys are uh, experts in the details of how we run this seminar series, but here's a quick recap. Use your full name in Zoom. This is convenient when we, uh, when we acknowledge you while asking questions. Please mute yourselves during the talk. If you have burning questions during the talk, please type them into the chat box. After the talk, uh, we will uh, have five minutes of question and answers for each of the talks. So again, use the chat box to send the questions to everybody. And as moderator, I'll choose and moderate questions. If we don't get to your questions in the five minutes interval for Q&A after the talk, we will have a chance to bring them up again in the 15 minute informal discussion after the talks are over. Please hang out with us and the speakers if you have, uh, if you have the time. And just so you know, the talks are being recorded. With that, uh, over to you, Ned, and welcome to everybody. Okay, hello everybody. Um, yeah, I wanted to start out by thanking the organizers. Um, first off, for putting together this fantastic series of seminars, and second, for giving me the opportunity to talk today about some work from my group. Um, I'm excited to tell you uh, about the topic of protein phase separation, in particular, something we've been doing involving magic numbers. So, um, in this relatively short time, I'm going to try to cover uh, a fair amount. So, let's see. There we go. So um, I'll start with necessarily a brief introduction to this topic of intracellular phase separation. And then I'll focus on a particular class of systems that involve associative polymers and indeed a particular system, something called the purinoid, uh, which I had not heard of until a few years ago, until I started working with a colleague, Martin Jonicus at Princeton, and now I've learned to love the pyrenoid. Uh, it's something very important to us since it's involved in carbon fixation. Uh, this has inspired us. Uh, and one of the things that has come out of it is uh, an idea about magic numbers in protein phase separation. And I'll tell you about some very recent work finding a unified magic number effect. And finally, something that's just hot off the presses about magic numbers in diffusion, and then tell you about some conclusions and open questions. So to begin, um, I borrowed this slide as I borrowed so many good things from Cliff Brangwen and his group here at Princeton. Uh, and this is a very busy slide, but it's meant to uh, introduce a few ideas. Uh, and stepping back, the idea is that we've known for many, many years that the eukaryotic cell is host to many organelles that are bound by membranes. Of course, you know, the nucleus, the mitochondria, in plants, there are chloroplasts and many others. Uh, but what has uh, been realized over the past decade or so is that this is actually the tip of the iceberg of intracellular organization inside of eukaryotic cells. That in addition to these membrane bound organelles, there is a plethora of non membrane bound organelles that are held together by the physical process of phase separation. What I mean by that is that various proteins or RNAs in the cell act together by physical interactions to condense just in the way that if you mix oil and water, uh, oil and water would separate without having any you know, biological machines required to make the oil form droplets in the water. Um, again, this, there's a lot going on in this slide. What I wanna emphasize is several things. First, that, this, that these processes are ubiquitous that they're taking place uh, in the nucleus, in the cytoplasm, that they involve um, uh, many biological processes uh, from transcription and genome organization to metabolism, to sequestering materials for later use. Uh, second, that these uh, phase separated um, bodies are 
very dynamic. They form and disperse. Um, for example, in the case of, you hope you can see my cursor, uh, the purinosome in cells that are starved for purines, the enzymes of purine biosynthesis get together in these puncta to make the synthesis more efficient. This is beautiful work from Steve Bankovic's group. But then when purines are provided, those um, phase separated bodies decondense uh, due to manipulation by the cell of the proteins themselves, changing their physical interactions. Uh, one point that I want to make that's important for what comes next is that there are many, many components inside of each of these bodies. So in the case of the purinosome, there are all of the enzymes involved in purine biosynthesis, but often there are hundreds of different components. Many of these, of course, are required for the particular function, whether it be transcription, genome organization, or DNA repair. But often not all of these components are required for the phase separation per se, sometimes only one component, or very frequently a small number of components have to get together in some kind of complex that provides a scaffold. And the other components are then brought in by specific interactions, but they're not required for phase separation. So what I want to focus on today is a particular class of these uh, components that require two separate molecules in order to phase separate. And so this is the case of associative polymers. This has been known for us for many years, charged polymers with positive and negative charges can associate and phase separate. Um, one of the distinctions here in this biological context is very often these bodies are held together not by sort of generic interactions such as charge or hydrophobicity, but by very specific interactions. Um, so uh, in particular, a particular protein will bind to a particular sequence of another protein or an RNA, forming these one-to-one -one saturable interactions. And here's an example of an engineered system along these lines um, from Mike Rosen and his group, where they uh, engineered a protein with repeats of one domain and another protein with repeats of another sequence such that the domains of the first one interact in a one-to-one -one fashion with the domains of the second one. Individually, these two macromolecules don't phase separate, but when they're mixed, these one-to-one -one interactions along with the multivalent character that there are many binding sites on each of the polymers for each of the others lead to phase separation. Um, and what's also emphasized here is that these processes of binding are actually um, transient in the sense that binding and unbinding occurs, allowing for these uh, phase separated bodies to be actually liquid. And you can see in the bottom an example here that two of these droplets, first off they're spherical, which is suggestion that perhaps they're liquid being uh, held in this form by, by surface tension. But then you can see very clearly that when they get close to each other and merge, they uh, they merge in exactly the same way that two droplets of oil brought together in water would merge into a larger one because they're internally liquid. Now, um, this is the introduction, and now I want to uh, focus on a particular example of one of the systems that's held together by some forms of associate polymers, and that is the pyrenoid. So uh, the pyrenoid, uh, is an organelle that appears inside of algae and plants. Uh, and while you may not have heard of it, you're definitely taking advantage of it because it's responsible for something like 30 to 40% of all CO2 fixed on Earth uh, every year. And of course, as organisms based on carbon that survive by eating uh, sugars, uh, we rely on carbon fixation. So thanks to the pyrenoid. Uh, here is an electron micrograph of an algae chlamydomonas um, taken by my colleague Martin Janikas. Uh, there's a lot going on here. The false colored green region is the chloroplast where the photosynthesis is happening. But I want you to focus on this false colored blue region, the pyrenoid, where, um, where the action of carbon fixation is, is taking place, driven by the energy from light. And what's inside the pyrenoid, and it had been known for many, many years, is this enzyme Rubisco, which is you know, where the magic happens, that CO2s are fixed into sugars. 
And Rubisco is fantastic, a ubiquitous enzyme on Earth. Uh, it's only got one problem, and that is that it's very slow. So in order for these organisms to be able to fix a substantial amount of carbon, they have to have a lot of Rubisco. And it's all, in this case, packaged together as a way of making the Rubisco more efficient, because there's a whole system here that concentrates carbon dioxide where the Rubisco is present to make it as fast as possible. Now, these enzymes are also have uh, multiple functional subunits. There are eight identical subunits, uh, giving something kind of eightfold symmetry. A question that arises, though, is since there's no membrane around the pyrenoid, there are some starch granules, but there's holes in them, what is it that keeps the Rubisco actually from diffusing out into the chloroplast? And Martin and his group made the important discovery that there's another major player inside of the pyrenoid. And that's a linker protein called EPIC-1. Uh, and it characteristic of many of these phase-separated body, EPIC-1 is intrinsically disordered. That is, it doesn't fold up into a particular structure the way many proteins does. It's sort of a floppy chain. But it plays its role as a floppy chain, basically linking together the rubiscos. Uh, EPIC-1 has four nearly identical repeats. Uh, and these are now understood to bind to specific sites on the rubisco. So an EPIC-1 with its multiple repeats can bind to the rubisco, not only on multiple sites on that rubisco, but it can coordinate multiple rubiscos. And similarly, the rubisco with multiple binding sites can bind to multi multiple EPIC-1s. So together, these can condense, basically forming a network. And they're found to co-localize, and also, as I won't have time to show you, to actually liquid, so they're continually flowing around inside of the pyrenoid. Now, uh, this is great, and we could end right here and say, whoop, this is wonderful. There's uh, you know, uh, two associating polymers based on these multivalent associations, but there's something else going on that Martin and his group noticed when they looked at movies of what happens during cell division in these algae. And so uh, what you're seeing here is uh, fluorescence from a rubisco that's been labeled with a fluorescent protein. In this image, you can't see the whole algae, but the pyrenoid is here, it's condensed. And right before cell division, something interesting happens, which is that much of the rubisco and EPIC-1 leave the pyrenoid and disperse throughout the chloroplast. Um, and then following cell division, they condense again into the two pyrenoids, now one in each daughter cell. And this is not just a weird accident. This happens every time these cells divide. There is a dispersal of the material and then recondensing. And so there's a questions raised by this. And of course, in biology, there's always why and how questions. It's possible the why question here is more answerable than in many systems, um, because it's observed that sometimes during the cell division, instead of the pyrenoid being divided in two and half going to each daughter cell, sometimes uh, this doesn't work right and the pyrenoid squirts off to one side and one daughter gets the pyrenoid and the other one doesn't. But as a result of this material being dispersed, even the unlucky daughter has a lot of rubisco and epic one, which can then condense de novo into a new pyrenoid. So even that unlucky daughter can begin doing um, efficient carbon fixation. Um, that, of course, still leaves the how question. Let me show you then a movie. This is just saying uh, the same thing that's happening. Uh, but I want to emphasize that the time scales here are fast. This is a few minutes that this is all taking place. So we watch the movie. This is on this time scale of tens of minutes that these processes are happening. To be new proteins, old proteins being degraded, new proteins being made. These are the same proteins. And of course, the oddity is that phase separation is a physical process. So it's not supposed to, physics isn't supposed to change on this, not only on the time scale of 10 minutes, but at all. So why are these suddenly going from phase separated to not phase separated? And the answer must be that somehow these proteins are being modified. But what is it that's driving something that was so strongly condensed uh, on a, such a short time scale to make it now disperse? And so um, our job at, as theorists is to come up with crazy ideas. And so the crazy idea that we've been working on is that this might have something to do with the specific valence of the EPIC-1 and the Rubisco, how many binding sites each one has. And so let me. Go to the next slide. And so we're going to do some very, very simple modeling. 
In this case, um, we are going to do uh, something kind of ridiculously simple. We're going to say that each uh, Rubisco is a little block on a cubic lattice that's four sites by two sites. Those does give you eight binding sites. And the epics are going to be little polymers of different lengths. And here we're going to fool around and say, instead of length being four, for example, we'll try length three and length five. These are these little red uh, squiggles here. And they can interact in a one-to-one -one fashion. And indeed, you can see that if you make these interactions strong enough, then they will tend to phase separate. That is, a rubisco can be bound to multiple epics, an epic can be bound to multiple rubiscos, and this allows them to condense. This is a heat map of cluster size, showing that as the interactions get stronger and the density goes up, the system will tend to have larger and larger clusters. And you'll see that their clusters here in for epics of length three are actually uh, somewhat uh, smaller, or the clusters happen at an earlier uh, lower density if you have epic ones of length five, which makes sense. As you have longer polymers, they can bring more rubiscos together to be easier to phase separate. And so what happens in this length four that we were talking about that we saw four repeats in the epic one? Is it just an intercalation between these two? Um, and the answer is no. Something different happens when L equals four. Uh, you see that phase separation is strongly suppressed. You have to go up to much, much higher densities in order to get clusters. And if you can see these images, you can immediately see what's going on, that there's an alternative state of this system. Instead of these molecules forming clusters, they can form small happy families. So here is one rubisco with eight binding sites getting together with two epic ones, each with four binding sites, and everybody's happy. All the binding sites of the rubisco are satisfied. All the binding sites of the epic are satisfied. And this system has lots of translational entropy because each of these little happy families or trimers can move around and have translational entropy. And so what we see is that a very small change going from, say, five binding sites to four is enough to cause the system to go from a phase-separated regime to a dispersed regime where there's no phase separation. So, uh, OK, well, you may say, you know, Trust but verify. This is a two-dimensional lattice model. Uh, it's pretty sketchy whether this is going to has anything to do with the real system. How general is this effect? Can we can we actually see this in higher dimension? Um, uh, oh, before I move on to that, I should say that we ended up naming this effect the magic number effect, kind of an analogy to nuclear physics, where certain numbers of protons and neutrons are particularly stable. Here, particular valences are particularly stable, uh, giving rise to this uh, dispersed state. So, OK, but does it only exist in two dimensions on a square lattice? Well, hope not. Um, so we've gone on to do simulations, um, particularly driven by a fantastic postdoc here at Princeton, uh, Jun Zhang, who will be on the job market this year. So please be aware of, of uh, her applications. Um, uh, and she has uh, done not only a theory, but also these beautiful simulations where in 3D, we make polymers of, uh, in this case, the same length, allowing for a magic number effect, showing that they can form these little condensed uh, pairs, but at high enough density, they will also phase separate. Uh, and we can then measure things like the densities in the dense phase and in the dilute phase, showing how the phase boundaries actually vary uh, with things like uh, valence and stoichiometry. So what do we find with this? Um, well, we find certainly that there is a magic number effect uh, because the physics of that really has nothing to do with dimension. Uh, here, for example, with polymers of length 14 of one type, is A's of type length 14, and B's of different lengths, we see that the phase boundary, the concentration required to cause phase separation, has a peak here at 14. That means that a 14 and a 14 can get together, uh, and they don't need to phase separate because they're happy. Whereas if you have 14s and 11s, boy, these guys love to phase separate. And of course, we see other magic numbers here at 14 and 7 because 7 plus 7 equals 14. So what else can we learn about this phase separation? Well, it requires relatively strong interactions. This is the strong intera the interaction strength. Basically, the bonds have to be formed. That is, almost all of the bonds in the system that can form have to be formed 
in order for us to see the magic number effect. Um, but we've seen something else when we look, for example, in the tails here, that there is some kind of effect going on even at 14, 13, and 14, 15. And that turns out to be due to the fact that not only do you get nice combinations, for example, of a 14 and a 14, this is showing what's present in the simulations here in the dilute phase, but also when, for example, there's 14s and 15s are willing to get together and form not quite as happy couples and similarly 14s and 13s. And so we start to see that even though there is a tendency to phase separate in these systems, there's also something that says that one polymer can get together with another polymer and be pretty happy, even if they're not a perfect match. Um, what are the implications of this? Well, one is that stoichiometry matters. That is, if I have equal numbers of monomers, then you know, the unhappy families mean that there is some excess uh, of polymers left around. But if there's, um, but if there's no excess, um, things actually work out well. Now you can see this for the magic number case, stoichiometry, phase separation is, is repressed when the stoichiometry is just one to one. You wanna have one polymer joins with one polymer and that exhausts the system. But if you go to other cases, you see that in fact, the stoichiometry is such that the magic number effect happens when there are equal numbers of polymers in the system. So what I'm showing here is by color map of the onset of phase separation, bright colors here means that phase separation is suppressed. In other words, the system likes these small dimers in the dilute phase and doesn't want to phase separate. And of course that happens here at the case where it's 14, 14 and equal stoichiometry, but it also happens along this diagonal, which corresponds to the case of equal polymer numbers. Um, so, Time is limited, so all I will say is that this means that you can unify sort of the dependence on valence and stoichiometry to find that equal polymer stoichiometry suppresses phase separation. So um, time is limited, and I won't say much about the theory that goes along with these simulations other than that we're essentially dealing with a regime where energy is quenched basically all the bonds are formed. So phase separation is driven by a competition between entropy in the dilute phase, between the center of mass entropy of these dimers, which can go anywhere, or in the dense phase where there's less translational entropy, but more conformational entropy, because now instead of pairing up and having to do the same thing, the different polymers can all have different conformations. We've borrowed heavily from the work of Semenov and Rubinstein and Stickers to derive a free energy functional uh, giving us uh, free energy density as a function of concentration. And this lets us derive phase diagrams for the system. And we can see that with these analytical phase diagrams showing the two phase region at magic number cases and off magic number cases, we indeed see that we find this same uh, unified magic number effect where equal numbers of polymers, as long as the polymer lengths are not too different, suppress phase separation. So, uh, What's the latest? Well, the latest is that even if you look inside of the dense phase, which seems like it should just be a dense gel, no matter what, once it forms, there are magic number effects. So this is showing that on long time scales where the polymers are breaking bonds and moving around, um, that it actually still matters whether it's a magic number. And the magic number cases um, shown here in blue are more diffusive inside of the dense phase than the non-magic number case, suggesting another way that cells may be able to tune the internal liquidity of the condensates. So to conclude, I hope I've uh, at least interested you not only in um, intracellular phase separation, but also the possibility that magic numbers can enrich the possibilities for associative polymers, uh, that there's a unified magic number effect, that uh, phase separation is suppressed at equal polymer stoichiometry, and that magic numbers influence diffusion inside of condensates. Open questions are whether magic numbers could account for purinoid dynamics during cell division. The idea, as you saw, was maybe if you're off a magic number, you're condensed, and on a magic number, you're dispersed. Um, and then we're hoping there are other magic number effects in cells or synthetic systems, and we're interested in how valence and stoichiometry affect all the physical properties of condensates. So with that, let me thank uh, my colleagues uh, in particular, June, who did the work I showed you um, today, um, and our support, and thank you for your attention.
Um, well, thank you, Ned. Um, we have time for some questions, and there are lots and lots of questions. So I'm going to ask you a selection, and we will have an opportunity to get to some of the other questions during the informal discussions. Um, so starting off with Wallace's question from 1114, will pyranoid still split if cytokinesis is prevented? Uh, no. In fact, it is the cytokinetic ring that actually literally pinches through the pyranoid and physically splits it into two. Uh, that's a nice question. Cool. So, Rudra Biswas at 1116, what do the data say about the distribution of Rubisco in the daughters after division? Um, so, whether, as far as we know, um, the dispersed molecules are independent. So it's basically uniformly spread between the two daughters. Um, that's, that's just based on visual images. Great. So um, jumping to Omar Saleh at 1122, um, in the Rubisco system, you gave the impression that Rubisco is a solid particle, while the partner is flexible. Generally, how does the magic number effect depend on the internal flexibility of the two components? One can imagine internal conformational entropy plays a role. Oh, thank you. Wonderful. Um, we, we recently have a, a whole article in Nature Communications on exactly this point. Uh, and one of the, 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 the short answer is that rigidity is very important. Of course, if both components are rigid, it's very hard for them to find each other's binding sites. But the advantage of having one rigid component is that it didn't have any conformational entropy to give up. So if I have two polymers, they could each be free, and then when they get together, you know, sort of one of them has to give up its conformational entropy. But if the Rubisco didn't have any conformational entropy to begin with, and the Epic can still bind to it in multiple ways, that really favors um, this magic number state, because now the, the Rubisco didn't, didn't have any entropy to begin with, and so it's perfectly fine forming this, you know, small family of one Rubisco and, say, two Epic ones. Thanks for that question. Um, Ashok Prasad at 1122, what happens if the binding between the monomers of the two polymers are non-identical? The binding between the two is non-identical. Now, I'm not quite sure I understand that question. Maybe uh, you could. Uh, I guess I meant if the polymers were heterogeneous. So you had some strong binding sites and some weak binding sites. Okay, sure. I mean, this becomes extremely rich and, 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 uh, and, and wonderfully complex. Um, so I, I can't give you a short answer to that, but I can say that, you know, this is something we're certainly very interested in and is certainly relevant to the real biology because very, very typically these condensates can compare or consist of strong binding interactions, say between two protein interfaces and weak nonspecific interactions by intrinsically disordered uh, floppy polymers. So it seems like biology is, is, has asked and answered this same question, and maybe you'll have to stay tuned to hear from our group at least. Thanks. Um, Nancy Ford at 1124, are there post-translational modifications, example, phosphorylase, phosphorylase, Yes. The answer is yes. Um, EPIC-1 is known to be phosphorylated. Um, we are working hard with Martin Janikas and uh, uh, Guan Wahi and members of his group. Uh, we've been able to reconstitute the Rubisco EPIC-1 system, so they phase separate now in vitro. Um, and studying whether these phosphorylations are modifying that is definitely on our agenda. Cool. Uh, Irvin Frey at 1124. How do the condensates actually split up? Well, uh, that is just something visual. I mean, you can look at these movies, you see the condensate gets kind of smaller and a little bit elongated often, just kind of in the right direction to be split for reasons we don't understand. But then it really looks like, you know, the, the cytokinetic ring literally pinches through them. So it's, it, in this case, it's, it's not mysterious how they divide in two. There's a, there's a strong, you know, constricting ring that forces this to happen. How they line up is a fantastic question, which uh, we really don't understand yet. Okay, last question, combo question from two people. Uh, Sarah Liang at 1124 and Brian Zhu at 1124. Do you have any idea how 
cell, cells regulate the magic numbers? And can we infer the magic numbers from protein structure and charge distributions? Yeah, I mean, our idea is exactly goes back to this earlier question that we, we believe there are post-translational modifications and phosphorylation is a natural candidate, right? It can be fast uh, and one, you know, phosphate group adding that charge can have a very strong effect on, on um, binding affinities. So, so we're imagining, for example, that you have a valence, say, of, of four and you phosphorylate one side, now your valence is down to three. Those numbers, I should say, are still in flux as the experiments go on, but, but, but that's the idea. Um, and, you know, there are many other post-translational modifications that could be playing similar roles. So I think I'll have to end with that and, and thank everyone for, uh, for, for joining me this morning and pass this on to our next speaker. So let me... So thank you very much, Ned, and thank you to the super enthusiastic audience for asking these awesome questions. Over to you, Ding. Would you uh, go ahead and share your screen?